Why are you bloated and how can you fix it? This is a conversation I have collectively had hundreds of times with patients in my practice and something I've experienced a lot throughout my own life. I myself was diagnosed with SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, when I was in my early 20s, went through the reams of GI specialists, and that made me solidly lose faith in becoming a traditional medical doctor, which is why I did not. And I became a doctor of acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. But what is the origin of bloating? And what is the origin of lots of these kinds of GI problems that people have? And what can we do about it? In this video, I thought I would share five herbs in specific that can particularly help bloating and GI issues and what to do for healthy digestion overall. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Alex Hine, board licensed acupuncturist and doctor of traditional Chinese medicine and author of the health book, Master of the Day. So let's get into the very first part. One of my classmates working on her doctoral capstone called it, the road to health is paved with good intestine. This is a little sort of quip, a little play on words because in traditional Chinese medicine, we say the digestive system is the root of what we call postnatal qi. You're basically your life force after birth, which means outside of your genetic material, which of course influences is whether you're sickly or a bit strong or you have a certain tendency towards certain symptoms. The way to have good vitality in life is good digestion. So we say the qi generates the blood and the digestive system really generates the qi. Unless you're a qigong master, right? If you can like siphon the energy from the universe, then we don't need to be having this conversation because you figure it out. But for the rest of us, good digestion leads to good physiological function. Now in general, the dietetics approach in traditional Chinese medicine is focusing on what we call qi and wei. Qi being temperature and wei being flavor. Temperature being, is it like a cold food, like watermelon? Or is it a warm food, like ginger? And then the flavor. Right? Are we talking spicy or are we talking sour? These influence various physiological processes and even affect different organs differently. So let's jump in and talk about the top five herbs that I would recommend and how we use them clinically. So herb number one is shengjiang or ginger. Ginger is very interesting because in traditional Chinese medicine, we say ginger dispels stomach cold. But what does that actually mean? Usually stomach cold encompasses symptoms like low appetite, nausea, bloating, and just food sitting in the stomach, gastroparesis, right? Delayed gastric emptying, where it takes a long time. You notice if you and your friend have the same meal, they're hungry before you are. This is often what we're talking about. Now in one particular research paper called Ginger in Gastrointestinal Disorder, Orders, a systematic review of clinical trials. Researchers found that ginger accelerates gastric emptying and stimulates certain contractions in healthy individuals. Now they found that patients with functional dyspepsia, aka indigestion, saw improvements and impaired gastric emptying is well recognized contributor to this problem of functional dyspepsia, indigestion, as well as nausea. So ginger in particular helped improve these symptoms. And typically we use it for symptoms and patterns that we call like spleen chi deficiency, low enzymes, low appetite, that kind of thing. Herb number two is called baiju or attractylodes. Now we say baiju is an herb that primarily drains dampness. Now what does that actually mean? If you're someone who's always very phlegmy, you clear your throat a lot, you have post-nasal drip a lot, and you can't tell, is it my sinuses, is it my stomach? Could be both for some people. But in general, baiju is a fascinating plant where if you put the dried baiju root on your tongue, your tongue literally feels dry in two seconds because it sucks off the moisture of your tongue. And we find that some of the plants that grow in these swampy marsh-like climates, environments, have that ability to regulate water very well to prevent getting waterlogged and moldy and dying. Baiju is one of those herbs we use typically for what we call spleen dampness. The most common symptom would be bloating or a food baby, lots of mucus or phlegm spitting. Chronic spitting is often a spleen issue, spleen pancreas stomach issue as we call it. People who have indigestion or acid reflux a lot with saliva, whether it's warm saliva or just constantly feeling phlegmy and mucusy. And baiju dries that dampness as we call it. Now besides these two herbs, there are a couple other healing practices you can utilize for your digestion. And four of them I put into a free guide right below the video called four daily healing practices from traditional Chinese medicine you can use to lengthen your life. So check it out. The third herb is called fooling or poria. Poria is this white mushroom kind of fungus that grows on the base of these pine trees in China and East Asia. And fooling we typically use for anxiety, palpitations, but also to help with what we call spleen chi deficiency, spleen functional deficiency. Typically like the traditional diagnostic pattern of spleen chi deficiency as we call it is really like spleen pancreas stomach function. When we point it to like anatomical organs, low appetite, phlegmy, cold, tend towards fatigue or catching colds and flus very easily. Lots of mucus or saliva or spitting, they bloat, they get a food baby very easily, soft stools, diarrhea, 
prone towards getting bowel urgency after meals, that kind of thing we see. And for literally thousands of years, Baidru, the last herb, Atraculodes, and Fuling, Poria, are paired as the dream team, the husband and wife, of regulating spleen dampness. So regulating appetite, regulating bloating, regulating abdominal fullness. And actually some people experience a big boost in energy from just regulating digestive system. So Fuling, we also use for the GI, but also for overactive bladder because it's a potent diuretic. So it's very effective for urinary issues. Herb four is what we call Bancha or Penelia. Now Bancha is a common herb used in acid reflux because when you look at the research on it, it often treats conditions involving excessive mucus or inflammation. Now that inflammation can be the stomach, the nose, it can be the lungs even, chronic respiratory issues, chronic bronchitis, we're often using Bancha formulas. It helps expectorate phlegm, it helps slicken it up and help it pass or cough out. Also in the digestive system, in the stomach. So lots of people who have indigestion and acid reflux, we use formulas with high doses of Bancha. Now herb five we use is Guajir, cinnamon twig or bark, cinnamomy, ramulus. Guajir is amazing because when you look at studies done on cinnamon twig, it is magically antibacterial, antifungal. And when you look at the cinnamon bush, lots of plants won't even grow around it because of these volatile oils that it has. I mean, it's so potent. You've smelled cinnamon. Now imagine if you just covered the floor with cinnamon, how many creatures want to crawl on that? Even pungent to a human's nose and animals have thousands of times more sensitive sense of smell. It has this massive antibacterial quality to it, stimulating pungent spices often stimulate metabolism. So they're great for appetite generation. It's also great for anxiety. It's great for regulating the nervous system and the nerves overall. These five are general herbs I recommend quite a lot. And again, it depends on the person's constitution, their temperament, where they are. They have what we call stomach heat. You don't actually want to use cinnamon for these people. You want to use an herb called huangqin, scutellaria, which is skullcap. These bitter yellow herbs high in berberine that help clear inflammatory heat. And so we always want to adjust the diet based on what is happening with that person's constitution at that exact moment in time. If I had to give one practical piece of advice for bloating, minimize the number of sweet foods in your diet. We say sweet generates dampness in the spleen and sweet includes things like obviously sugar, fruit juices, beer, but it also includes things like starches overall, which is why when you look at research and even just clinically, very low carb diets are often the best for people who get excessive bloating. I mean, the low FODMAP, the specific carbohydrate diet, they're very low in carbohydrates. That's why they're amazing for people with small intestine bacterial overgrowth issues. Minimizing the amount of carbs in your diet or even cycling them. Today, I'm just gonna do rice with my lunch. No carbs with my other two meals besides plants. And then I'll do that for a couple of days and then go back to a normal diet. Or I'll do a week on and a week off or five days low carb and two days regular. That is often my fastest life hack for people who have significant bloating overall, besides just taking Chinese formulas because that'll take care of it no matter what. So my two cents on how to improve bloating and digestion. Again, don't forget guys, I've got that free guide below the video for you. If you ever wanna chat about booking a visit with me, there's a link to contact my clinic below this video. And I've just launched a brand new online program, Introduction to Healing with Traditional Chinese Medicine. You can check it out, it's the pinned comment below. And there's one more video for you here on healing your digestive system. One of the most important things, check it out.